Hello everyone, and apologies, we're a little bit late coming on to the webinar. Um, welcome to our next in a series of GDPR-focused webinars. Vin Banch, who often chairs, is away on business today, so it's me, Chris Jeffrey, stepping in with two of my colleagues, Debbie Haywood and Katie Knowles. Uh, for those of, uh, those of you who don't know us, um, Taylor Wessing is a global full-service law firm with 22 offices in 19 countries and a real focus on data and data protection in each of those geographies. Um, a quick plug, if I may, for our uh, global data hub. Um, I think you'll find this a really useful resource on the, the many changes which are happening in, in global privacy at the moment, including the GDPR, but not just the GDPR. We focus on developments in, in Asia and North America as well. And then another tool that we released quite recently, some of you may have seen, we've had some very nice feedback on, is our Global Data Protection Guide, which is an online tool which gives a really... Uh, useful snapshots of the basics of privacy law in over 65 countries, and that's really worth a look. Very quickly on the presenters, um, my name is Chris Jeffrey. I, for my sins, head up the technology and privacy team here at Taylor Wessing in London. I'm joined by Debbie Haywood, who's a senior professional support lawyer and our guru on all matters GDPR and one of our associates, Katie Knowles, who's leading on many of our GDPR projects. Um, I won't spend time on the agenda. I want, to, because we started a little bit late, let's get straight into the meat, because we've got quite a lot to talk about today. Key takeaways, um, understanding that some of you will be doing other things as you listen to a webinar like this and may get distracted. Um, the really key takeaways on commercial contracts and GDPR for me are first that the GDPR is much more prescriptive about what a commercial contract under which EU personal data is shared must contain. And I always think about them being in three buckets. One, when a data controller is appointing a data processor. Two, when a processor is appointing a sub-processor, think data center, think any kind of support provider sitting behind a vendor. And third, data sharing between co-controllers. Now, Debbie will take us through a summary of all three. And when Katie and I talk through some of the pain points, we'll be focusing on those pro controller processor and processor sub-processor contracts. Out there in the real world, in the market pace, um, vendors and customers in the EU are pushing out their standard GDPR-ready contracts now. Obviously, the law doesn't come into force until May of 2018, but even an annually renewing contract will flip over once the GDPR in for is in force. So commercial relationships where data is shared are typically done now under templates which are as GDPR-ready as they can be. Um, I say that because... Although we have sufficient detail in the, G in the GDPR itself to have a sensible commercial negotiation now, it's important to note that market practice is nascent, um, nascent meaning all over the place, and EU controllers in particular are very concerned about managing their, their risk. Um, guidance and enforcement will inform the detail next year, but until we have that, we really are in a little bit of a gray area, doing our best to close deals for clients and achieve compliance with clients against the background, of course, of a much more prescriptive piece of legislation and the threat, how real it is we will see in due course, but the threat of those very high potential fines. I think, I think it's important to note, just before we get into the meat, uh, and Debbie takes us through the requirements, to note that the contracts are part of a wider GDPR compliance project. They're not the whole GDPR by any means. And when you're thinking about how you will approach, whether you're on a controller or the processor side, or actually you perform both roles for different data, data flows, you need to identify and categorize who you share data with and who you receive data from. You need to include the new GDPR processor obligations, and you need to ensure a whole 
piece of governance and process and training and documentation is in place to the extent you can, because many companies are not going to get there, but you certainly need to hit those main GDPR points by May of 2018. And with that, I will pass over to Debbie. Thanks, Chris. Um, I mean, I completely uh, agree with what Chris has said, and that's why I'm going to start by looking at the big picture before we get down into the detail of, of what the GDPR says on this issue. Um, because GDPR compliance really is about more than just complying with the letter of the law. And regulators are going to be looking at whether you're complying with the spirit of the law as well. Paying lip service just isn't going to be enough, uh, but complying with the spirit of the law may well help you with regulators if things do go wrong. So I just want to start by reminding ourselves of, of the data protection principles. While they don't relate to the detail of what you need to include in your contracts, they are the heart and soul of the GDPR, and they should inform everything you do in relation to data protection. So if you keep them in mind while you're drafting and negotiating agreements, you will find it much easier to ensure GDPR compliance. Um, the first principle, 5.1a, that data must be processed lawfully, fairly, and in a transparent manner, is primarily the concern of the controller, but in order to comply with it, the controller needs to ensure flow down in contracts. Where the controller has an obligation, which a processor or joint controller with it will assist with, the contract should deal with this. And recently published ICO draft guidance, very recently, in fact last week, um, provides a checklist that you can help to use, to, you can use to help you capture all of these points. The remainder of Clause 5.1 is, is a useful reminder of issues your contracts will need to deal with clearly. They talk about responsibility, process, and liability, and you need to think about them and deal with them in the contract. So, these include data minimization, that personal data sh processing should be limited to what is necessary in relation to the purpose for which it's processed. Accuracy, the data has to be accurate and kept up to date, with inaccurate or out-of-date data being deleted or changed as quickly as possible. Storage limitation, this is about making sure that individuals are not identified for longer than necessary in relation to the purpose for which the data was originally processed, subject to certain exceptions. Integrity and confidentiality, that's about data security, keeping the data secure and preventing unauthorized access or processing by using appropriate technical or organizational methods. Now, this is a phrase which is repeated at regular intervals in the GDPR, and it doesn't tell you an awful lot about what is expected. Um, but finally, you have the accountability principle. You not only have to comply with your obligations under the GDPR, you have to be seen to comply. You have to be able to demonstrate compliance, and being able to point to a compliant contract will be an important part of this, although obviously it's only going to help if you're actually complying with it. Um, you also should keep in mind uh, the concept of privacy by design and default. The idea behind this is that you embed data privacy into all areas dealing with the processing of personal data, and that's going to include your contracts. So the principles act as a guide, but they don't give you the full story. For example, other major elements you need to deal with in contracts are giving effect to data subject rights and covering off liability. In the draft guidance, the ICO says indemnities must be clear and also recommends the contract make clear that it's the controller who controls what's happening to the data. It's worth noting here that the GDPR explicitly says that if you act like a controller, you will be treated as one, no matter what you are called in the contract. Finally, the ICO also recommends that the contract state expressly that nothing in it relieves the processor of its direct responsibilities and liabilities under the GDPR. So much for the spirit of the law. Let's look at the letter of the law. What does the GDPR actually say you have to include in your contract? The GDPR has specific requirements in relation to joint, joint controller, controller to processor, and processor to subprocessor arrangements. In relation to joint controllers, a joint controller relationship is one where two or more controllers jointly determine purposes and means of processing. Article 26.1 of the GDPR requires joint controllers to identify their compliance responsibilities in, and I'm quoting here, a transparent manner. A formal contract isn't the only way to do this, and the GDPR only talks about having an arrangement in place, but the addition of the transparency requirement does suggest that writing this down is going to be the best way to comply. And it's also worth bearing in mind that the essence of the arrangement also has to be made available to data subjects. The GDPR is fairly precise about what the arrangement needs to cover. 
you have to set out the respective responsibilities for compliance, in particular as regards exercising the rights of the data subject. Um, you have to set out respective duties to provide, provide required information to data subjects and the respective roles and relationships of the joint controllers to the data subject, including who gives them that information. Although note that the data subject has the explicit option of exercising their rights in respect of and against each of the controllers. And this means you should negotiate and document contractual liability between you, something that Chris and Katie are going to talk about in more detail in a minute. The controller is under an obligation to use only processes providing sufficient guarantees to implement appropriate technical and organisational measures in order to meet the requirements of the GDPR. This means that the controller needs to carry out due diligence in the appointment process. Now, while that doesn't expressly introduce specific contractual requirements, it will help the controller demonstrate they've complied if they cover off risks in the processor contract, especially anything particular to the processor which may have come to light during, during the, um, the process. As with so many areas of GDPR compliance, documenting what is going on is one of the keys to demonstrating accountability, and commercial contracts are no exception to the rule. The GDPR requires a contract between the controller and processor, processor unless the processing takes place under a binding EU or member state law. But you should remember that for the purposes of the UK, the ICO has said it will almost certainly be a contract that's required. And at this point, the GDPR becomes highly specific. The contract must set out at least the following. The subject matter of the processing, the duration of the processing, the nature and purpose of the processing, the type of personal data being processed, the categories of the data subject, the obligations and the rights of the controller. So what this really means is that contract has to spell out in some detail the data processing activities which are being contracted out to the processor. And even that is not the full extent of it. The contract also has to place a number of obligations on the processor and require the processor to process the personal data only on the documented instructions of the controller. And note the word, use of the word documented. This doesn't necessarily mean you have to cover all the instructions in the initial contract, but it may be useful to include a process for providing further instructions. For example, who's authorized to give them, to whom do they need to be sent, and how quickly they may need to be acted on. The GDPR singles out data transfers in particular as an issue on which the processor must contractually agree to adhere to the instructions of the controller. Appropriate confidentiality obligations in respect of persons authorized to process personal data need to be included. The processor has to agree to comply with the security obligations under Article 32 of the GDPR. The processor needs to agree to only appoint sub-processors in compliance with the GDPR, and we'll be talking about that in a minute. Taking into account the nature of the processing, the processor will assist the controller by appropriate technical and organization methods, there's that phrase again, insofar as this is possible for the fulfillment of the controller's obligation to respond to requests for the exercising of data, subjects, right, data subject rights. And again, this is a fairly vague provision, um, which we're going to talk about more in a minute. The processor has to assist the controller with its security and breach obligations breach reporting obligations, sorry. Again, this is supposed to take into account the nature of the processing and the information available to the processor, so it's not a blanket obligation. The processor has to comply with deletion or return requests by the controller at the end of the contract, assist with accountability, allow inspections and contribute to orders or audits, and deal with the processor's obligations in relation to appointing sub-processors. Now, it's not a requirement that you have to deal with liability issues uh, as far as the GDPR is concerned, but for the first time in EU law, data processors will have direct liability to data subjects in relation to certain GDPR breaches, and they can be fined by regulators. So as a result, all the parties are going to have an even greater interest in ensuring contractual liability is dealt with in the way that is most advantageous to them. Finally, we need to touch on um, what the GDPR says about the appointment of sub-processors. A, a processor may not appoint another processor without prior specific or general written authorization from the controller. Where the controller gives general authorization, the processor needs to update the controller about any intended changes to sub-processors and give the controller the opportunity to object. <coughs> 
the controller to process the contract needs to deal with this. In, it, and it needs to discuss whether authorization is going to be general or specific and how the notification and approval processes work in the case of a general authorization. A processor also has to in, ensure that it has a written contract with any sub-processors or that the engagement is covered by a legal act. The contract has to impose the same obligations on the sub-processor as the processor has under its contract with the controller, including, you've guessed it, securing sufficient guarantees that the sub-processor will implement appropriate technical and organizational method, measures in such a way that its processing will meet GDPR requirements. Under the GDPR, the processor remains liable to the controller for the performance of the sub-processor's obligations. Again, that means the allocation of contractual liability will be of vital importance between the processor and any sub-processors. It's worth noting at this point that as yet there are no standard approved controller to processor clauses or processor to processor clauses under the GDPR, although there is scope to introduce these, but at the moment there's no easy fix. A crumb of comfort is held out uh, on the understanding that their adherence to future codes of conduct may be used to demonstrate processor compliance. And you never know, these may give more clues on what organizational and technical measures are going to be appropriate in different circumstances. We're also expecting ICO guidance to give us uh, more help on this issue in the future. But um, bearing that in mind, I'm going to hand over to Chris and Katie, who are going to talk in more detail about drafting and negotiating these types of contracts. Okay, thanks, Debbie. Um, identity crisis may seem like an odd title for a GDPR talk, but the, the point I'm making here is that the, the specific requirements for contracts of the GDPR really force platforms and vendors to think about whether the way they process data through their platform is really purely with a processor hat on, if I can use that phrase, or whether they sometimes do so as a controller, bearing in mind this is still largely their customer's data. It is harder to fudge that distinction than it is under the current directive. Now, for many platforms, it's not a problem. It's pretty clear, and you don't need to agonize about whether you fall into the controller or the processor category. But for a lot of SaaS platforms, and I mentioned there on the slide digital advertising and big data, but actually when I thought about it, I think practically every SaaS platform that we, we act for will do analytics to improve the platform, often using live customer data with unique anonymous IDs attached. Now, the GDPR, with an expanded definition of personal data, would hold that data to be personal. And because its analytics are not really done for the benefit of a specific customer, it's likely the platform acts as a controller. So just that flag, it happens at the moment, but a lot of that happens under the radar. I think the answer largely is, and of course it's very fact specific, the platforms need to be probably more open with their controller customers about that use. Not least because if you look through Article 28 that Debbie was talking about, every processor contract has to oblige the processor to delete personal data at the end of the relationship, and that typically doesn't happen for this analytics use. That's all I'm going to say on that, so we, we have time to go through everything else. And we thought that a very useful way of walking through the various issues that the GDPR presents for controllers and processors and exploring drafting tips would be to present both sides of the argument. So I'll be speaking on behalf of controllers, typically large EU corporates operating in financial services, retail, tech and luxury brand sectors, and Chris will have his processor hat on. So staying with Article 28.1 for now that, that Debbie mentioned, this really provides the backbone of the controller-processor relationship in stating that controllers should only use processors providing sufficient guarantees to implement appropriate measures in such a manner that the processing both meets the requirements of the GDPR and ensures the protection of the rights of data subjects. So what does this mean for contracts? And here we're not just talking about processor guarantees in the context of security, which is important and we will cover. Rather, it's pointing to pre-contractual inquiries and due diligence. And as Debbie mentioned, controllers will need to assess the adequacy of their processes at the earliest stage possible, well before negotiating the contract, almost as part of a data protection impact assessment. 
And in putting a service out to tender as, as controller, you may wish to rely on due diligence questionnaires, FAQs, minimum security criteria to enable you to compare your suppliers. And your assessment should naturally take into account the nature of the processing and risk to data subjects. So this article sets the due diligence bar higher and is a reminder that pre-contractual inquiries are just as important as what is written in black and white. I've worked on a couple of deals for clients in the financial services and retail sectors recently that involved the outsourcing of their internal HR databases to third-party cloud providers. And the risk here, of course, from a privacy perspective, is high as we're talking about sensitive data and data subjects potentially spanning numerous jurisdictions. And in both cases, the due diligence stage went on for months to enable us and the legal team to do an effective gap analysis of their credentials and feedback to the business. The ICO guidance that Debbie mentioned makes it clear that as controller, once you have chosen a suitable processor, you must put in place a contract which, which meets all the requirements of Article 28.3. So these two stages of finding a suitable processor and documenting the relationship are separate and distinct. I wanted to touch just briefly on the issue of warranties regarding compliance with data protection legislation, as this is an issue that does sometimes arise. Um, so the vast majority of services agreements that we see already include a mutual warranty that both customer and supplier, controller and processor, will comply with applicable laws, which would include data protection legislation. But processors often insist upon having the benefit of an additional warranty regarding data protection from their controllers. This is nothing new, but controllers are technically not obliged to provide it, and it is not essential for the purposes of a GDPR. Of course, in practice, it is obviously in the controller's best interest to comply with all applicable law, but controllers do not need to expose themselves unnecessarily to processes in this way and provide an additional course of action for breach of warranty. And then looking at that from the processor's point of view, I think you'd make, actually make a very similar point. It may feel almost automatic that everyone commits to comply with applicable law. Why on earth would you do business with someone who doesn't want to? But I think you need to be more careful for that from the processor's perspective as well. So I think a commitment to, a, to comply with the processor's obligations as a processor under the GDPR would make perfect sense. As Debbie said, processors now have their own direct responsibilities under the legislation. But I do worry sometimes that a more general commitment of compliance with the GDPR full stop could be read as transferring part of the controller burden onto the processor. It's a, it's, it's a gray area. There, there's no case law on that. I also think that because Article 28 is so prescriptive, it requires us as a processor to say, we'll only use the data for the purposes of the services and in accordance with the controller's instructions. We have to say that already. And I struggle to see if we do that and everything else that Article 28 requires, what it is that a processor can do that hurts a controller that isn't already covered. So I would beware as a platform that same general commitment um, to comply. So just, just looking at data security, as part of choosing a processor that provides sufficient guarantees that we keep talking about, controllers will be keen to ensure that they have oversight of their processor security measures and may wish to vet their information security policies. Given the, given the need to set out the guarantees in writing, we will continue to see detailed security policies annexed to services processing agreements. The GDPR does not change the standard of security required. Rather, as we've said already, it is more prescriptive in providing an extra level of detail about what measures may be expected and how security of data may be achieved, which will depend upon the, risk, the levels of risk presented by the processing, as is the case under the current law. So what does this actually mean in terms of contractual risk? So whilst it's in both the controller's and the processor's interest to assess their proposed security measures given the application of Article 32, the ICO guidance, the one that was, the re that was released last week, states that ultimately it is for the controller to satisfy itself that its processors provide sufficient guarantees in this area. And that's right. But the risk 
in terms of regulatory fines is arguably weighted against controllers. Under Article 83.4a, the ICO has the ability to fine organisations up to 10 million euros or 2% of annual global turnover, so the first tier, for breaches of Articles 28 and 32. However, a breach of Article 5, which includes the integrity and confidentiality principle that Debbie mentioned, that could attract the fine of second tier fines, so up to 20 million euros or 4% of annual global turnover, and that's set out in Article 83.5a. Therefore, controllers are still very much on the hook and as a result, we may see them impose their own security addenda on processes more frequently, given that they are effectively being asked to sign off on the appropriateness of security measures. And then looking at it from the processor perspective, I guess the key message is to be ready for more due diligence requests from your controllers and perhaps a longer sales lead time, at least in the short term before things settle down under the GDPR. And I know all this sounds like an extra burden and all very negative, but I also think there's a sales opportunity there for the processors who get this right. I've just come from a session with one of our platform clients looking at doing just that, looking at playing how their platform, which amongst other things does focus on security, is actually a tool to help their controller customers keep compliant. So there clearly is an element of opportunity here. Things I would be ready for, though, as a processor generally, is to preempt some of those customer concerns around security with your, your own FAQs, white papers, maybe, maybe a draft privacy impact assessment, even though that's technically only a GDPR requirement on the controller, and to use those to show, A, that you understand your controller customer's problem and that you're sympathetic to it, particularly if you're not a European headquartered company yourself, and B, that you've already taken steps. Now, they may not think they're enough. They may have lots of questions to ask, but again, you've taken steps to move them much closer to GDPR compliance. I think that psychological comfort factor can be an important one. Where the GDPR goes further and has something different to say about um, security that you need to bear in mind is it mentions specifically pseudonymization, it mentions encryption, but that's on most people's radar already, and the need for backup and disaster recovery, and not just what is sometimes the narrower security concerns around firewalls and password protections and that kind of perimeter security, if you like. Because the GDPR mentioned those elements, you need to play out those elements in any paperwork that you try and put in front of your customers. Now, Article 28, as we've heard, requires the controller to sign off on the appropriateness of the measures taken at the contract stage. So I think that means Whereas some contracts now talk very generically about appropriate technical and organizational measures, as Katie was saying, expect them to be specific. And Katie's absolutely right. A lot of controllers will have at least their own template bunch of security steps. But because we're the processor and it's our platform, we need to preempt those as much as we can. But we take the security steps that we take, if you like, and we should be clear about those, put them through a GDPR filter, but present those in our, in our template MSAs and, and data processing addenda. On the subject of subprocessing, the current rules simply apply the common contract law provisions on subcontracting. However, in practice, many arrangements have interpreted the current directive as requiring sub-processors to be appointed on the same terms that apply to processors and subject to controller approval, particularly in heavy, heavily regulated sectors such as financial services. Consequently, the requirement under Article 28.4 for processors to flow down the same terms to their sub-processors and remain liable for any breach is unlikely to make much difference in practice, as this is what many controllers have been insisting upon today. Of course, where the GDPR expressly differs from current law is in the ability for controllers to give general authorization to subprocessing, as Debbie mentioned. Of course, controllers may still insist on the requirement for consent at all times to keep maximum control over the supply chain. But where they do decide to give general authorization, and we have seen this, they should think very carefully about how to document what would happen in the event they wish to object to a change in processor. And there are a number of ways of exploring this. Um, and the way we sometimes provide for this is to allow 
say, the parties to explore changing the services in a way that would avoid the use of the proposed subprocessor. And where this is not feasible or the changes are not carried out within a specific time frame, the controller is then given the ability to terminate the contract with immediate effect. And that termination could apply to the contract in its entirety or the part that relates to the affected services on the basis that both parties walking away from a deal may not be the preferred solution. Again, in terms of drafting, the GDPR creates a specific subcontracting regime in relation to processing, as currently the appointment of another processor is treated in the same way as any other subcontracting. So this may result in two clauses appearing, one for data processing related subcontracting and the other for other types of subcontracting. The important thing to bear in mind is that the two types of subcontracting must exist alongside each other, however they're documented. And then from the process of you flipping the coin over, of course the real challenge here is this is one of the areas where it feels like the GDPR is living in a completely different world from the way technology certainly is supplied these days. As the world moves into the cloud, one of the beauties of which is, is the efficiencies driven by having the same vendor base data centers, support providers, call centers, whatever it might be, the notion that a customer or a group of customers can veto you changing one of those is clearly a real challenge to processors. Now, as Katie and Debbie have mentioned, that specific or general consent is clearly some that the processor community are focusing very much on the general authorization, as you would expect. And when you look at what many of the really big uh, sub-processors often are, are putting out, we've seen GDPR ready addenda and terms from Salesforce, Microsoft, AWS, and Google. And each of them in a different way play the kind of game that, that Katie's talking about. They don't allow any customer a straightforward veto over the appointment of a new sub-processor. They have maybe a schedule or a register some of them, and I think you should do this because the GDPR says so, when, if there's a change, you should notify your controller customers in Europe. Sometimes I see rights to object only on reasonable or specified grounds, like uh, they're a competitor or security concerns, not always. And there's always that, ultimately, a right to terminate. And then, of course, the thorny question about whether any prepaid fees should be prepaid to the customer, which, of course, is, a, is often the case, but not always, and is a, is, a commercial, is a commercial discussion. I guess the other obvious point when you're the processor sat between, if you like, uh, uh, an AWS or a Microsoft or Azure or whoever it might be, and a large European customer, is you're going to have some piggy in the middle to risk to deal with there. You will not be able to back-to-back -back the terms you get from those huge global platforms because typically they are not negotiable. You will not be able to back-to-back -to -back them perfectly with the commitments you're asked to give by a major European corporate. But of course, you know, our job as attorneys is to do our best and, that will, and that's what we must do. I think from a compliance perspective, platforms often ask me, if I can't get perfectly GDPR compliance commitments from one of those big global players, what do I do? Am I at risk of being fined? And the honest answer is, we don't know. But personally, my instinct is, if you've done whatever you can and you look like that good corporate citizen, my hope is that the regulators will recognize the realities of doing business and, uh, and, and be tolerant where those provisions don't quite match the, the requirements of the GDPR. Just turning to data subject rights. Again, this is similar to the sub-processing conversation we've had. Uh, historically, data protection clauses have required processes to assist with subject access requests as a matter of common practice. However, the GDPR goes a step further in expressly requiring processes to assist controllers in their compliance with data subjects, Chapter 3 rights, which have been enhanced. This is fairly straightforward when it comes to documenting what the lead processor needs to do. However, as and when sub-processes are appointed, those subcontracts will need to make clear that the obligation to assist relates to the controller's obligations under the head contract rather than the lead processor's obligations. So acting as controller, there needs to be this complete flow down of this primary obligation to all sub-processes down the chain. 
controllers, obviously from a technical perspective, you'll want to ensure that processes and so sub-processes design their services in a way that facilitates dealing with requests from data subjects, particularly given the fact that time scales for responding to these requests have shortened to one month under Article 12.3. Processor cooperation is clearly essential in enabling us controllers to comply. However, the duty is not infinite, and there is bound to be scope for creativity in contracts, as I'm sure Chris will explore now. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. Um, so I think, just putting this in context a moment, what, what processor clients stress, maybe controllers too, stress most about, because we're now on a fairly constrained time frame to May 2018. It's one thing if the legal and compliance team needs to look at governance, needs to look at what a contract says, a privacy policy, consent on websites and so on. But the real stress around the timing of the GDPR is if we need to make engineering changes to the platform itself. Because that is not an easy discussion to go to the CTO and say, I want to take three of your engineers off the core product roadmap and they want to, I want them to build these GDPR focus tools that say automate an erasure request or automate an access request. When a data subject comes to a, your controller and says, tell me all the data that you hold about me. So that's the major red flag. But this can drive those kind of engineering changes. Another important aspect for the processor, though, is that the commitment, the obligation to assist that we must give to our controller customers in the contract is caveated in the GDPR, caveated by phrases like, insofar as is possible, and where relevant to the processing. Caveat that often in controller drafted GDPR ready contracts um, strangely disappear from the strangely disappear from the text, or perhaps not so strangely. But I think the key thing for me is not to get immediately into a bit of a tug of war about whose problem this is, but really to take a step back and say, looking at the data, looking at what this platform does. What kinds of requests are we likely to give, number one, not likely to get? People are expecting to see more of these. And then second, if we get these requests, looking at erasure, uh, looking at rectification, looking at access, looking for some platforms at data portability too, who is best placed to deal? Does the platform already, for instance, allow the controller to go in and suck out all the personal data held on the platform that relates to a specific user? Or is there an easy way to model a tool from the existing functionality? So I think that's the key question for me. How likely are these subject right access rights, sorry, these data subject rights to come in? And secondly, who is best placed to deal? And I think that, that sensible discussion should lead you to a conclusion about whether you actually need to build and engineer something here that will satisfy those, those requirements. Uh, another thorny issue, even once you've gone through that, the GDPR doesn't say when it talks about assisting a controller with any of these points, whether a processor is allowed to charge or not. And so that's really left down to a commercial negotiation. You can see processors saying, well, this just eats into my already narrow margins. If it's infinite, the assistance I must provide, you can see a controller saying, this is compliance with the law. So of course you can't charge me for it. And that discussion is ongoing. It hasn't, I think it's fair to say, has not yet settled down. So on the subject of audit rights, um, famous Article 28.3H incorporates, firstly, an information duty, and secondly, an audit obligation, which both assist controllers in demonstrating compliance with the accountability principle that Debbie mentioned at the beginning. Looking at how the article is worded, the obligation to allow and contribute to audit is incredibly vague and would technically permit controllers to request repeated audits during the term of an agreement. And controllers want to maintain as much flexibility as possible as to when to call an audit and who to involve in the process. The ICO, just taking a step back, has wide-ranging supervisory powers under Article 58, which include the right to carry out investigations in the form of audits and obtain access to the premises of controllers and processors. So we suggest that controllers include reference reference to audits conducted by the ICO as part of this audit obligation, and that this should come at no extra cost to the controller. This is a fairly obvious point, but when drafting data-specific audit rights, 
always check whether the controller customer has a general audit right elsewhere in the agreement. The same issues arise as they do in relation to the sub-processing point, in the sense that overlapping rights should be drafted carefully and the controller's right to audit, to call a data audit, should not be fettered unnecessarily. And then from the processor's perspective, looking at audit specifically, we've been here before with the model clauses. So those of you who are platforms hosting outside the US or perhaps with support provision, sorry, outside the EU or with support provision outside the EU may well be used to having this dance where if you're using, say, a data center that's hosted outside the EU, the model clauses say everyone must have a right of audit included in sub-processors and then the, the platform makes a perfectly rational argument that you can't bowl up to AWS's facility in Virginia and knock on the door and have, and have a look around. So in the cloud again, this needs to be managed and it needs to be softened. And I'd make a plea, although you know, it may fall on deaf ears, to the controller community to, to reflect that, that reality. Um, nascent market practice, in my view, is starting to mirror what we've done with the model clauses, which is soften the audit, the physical audit right, and move away from a right of inspection to a right to have a third party independent order report, made SOC 2 type thing, as an alternative, and perhaps allow physical audit of the processor's own premises, but not of a third party data center, perhaps where there's a reasonable basis for suspecting a security issue or a breach. Now, on the information uh, requirement, absolutely, you need to step up to the plate and make a commitment to assist around those information requests. And you might want to think a little bit about whether you can do that in advance. I talked about kind of pre-packaged sales documents, but maybe there's a way to build in to the documents you give a controller customer in advance some of the information that will assist. For instance, around the, uh, a high-level uh, summary of the security measures you may take and who you share it with the sub-processors behind. It'll never be an alternative to this a broader commitment to provide information um, but it may help and then and then again the delicate discussion about whether you're entitled to charge moving on to data exports quickly um, the GDPR extends the eighth principle under the data protection act and the requirements by specifically imposing an obligation on processors to act in accordance with the controllers instructions when it comes to cross-border data transfers Processors should already be compliant in this area as they are typically obliged to act solely on the instructions of their controllers. However, in practice, the possibility of direct statutory liability for processors as well as contractual liability vis-a-vis -vis their controllers creates a new category of risk for processors that engage in cross-border transfers. As controller, you'll want to ensure that any transfers outside the EU are subject to your consent which will include deciding which safeguard is most appropriate to legitimize the transfer in each case. This will also assist you as controller in keeping track of all tran transfers under your control, which will enab enable you to comply with your Article 31E obligation to maintain an internal record of processing activities, including any transfers to third countries and the appropriate safeguards. Yeah, and then from the, you know, we, we already have these rules as Katie's as Katie has said, um, often we find for clients, when they do their wider GDPR project, they typically find an element of sharing often outside the EU, which either they weren't aware of or has, which has not fully been documented with model clauses or privacy shield or some other kind of compliance mechanism. And, and that brings it out to the open. So often there is some more work to be done around this. In the contract itself, Obviously, the processor wants to get as many upfront consents to export out of the, out of the EU as you, as you need in the contractual documentation. And to do that, you're going to have to commit. I guess it's obvious, but it's worth saying. You're going to have to say how you're going to keep your controller customer compliant there, privacy shield or model clauses. For US platforms specifically, many are on privacy shield. We all know it's under challenge. I still like it as an option when you're looking at European business generally. But, and this is the key flag, particularly in some continental European countries, Germany, France, Spain, I would expect to have 
model clauses in your back pocket as well, because unhelpful comments, I guess, from some German politicians that um, privacy shield is a joke have been well publicized, and their regulators are kind of putting up with it, but a little bit sniffily. Now turning to liability. So whereas under the current regime the liability of processes is essentially contractual, the new regime with direct obligations on processes brings with it the possibility of third party claims, claims under contract and regulatory fines which naturally affect contractual risk allocation. The slide in front of you um, sets out figures that we have seen in recent months. I wouldn't say these are market standard by any means, caps are very much fact specific. But liability is still generally capped as a multiple of contract value or by reference to the ICO or the relevant supervisory authority, maximum fine. And many controllers, and this is often the case in the financial services sector, insist upon higher liability caps for data-related breaches and some are left uncapped. Under the GDPR, where a breach occurs due to unlawful processing by a processor, the controller will be jointly and severally liable for the damage if it too was in some way responsible, no matter how minor the responsibility. So only if the controller can prove it was not in any way responsible for the event giving rise to the damage can it avoid liability for breach caused by a processor. And the recent ICO guidance reminds us that Article 82 permits controllers to claim back all or part of the compensation they have paid out from their processor corresponding to their own part of responsibility for the damage. Looking at Article 82.2 in more detail, controllers are on the hook for any damage caused by processing which infringes the GDPR. Processors, on the other hand, are only liable where they have not complied with the obligations of the GDPR, specifically directed to processors, or where they have acted outside or contrary to lawful instructions of the controller. In other words, Parties bringing claims against processes under the GDPR must prove an additional element apart from damage and general non-compliance, namely that the processor has violated one of their specific legal duties or contractual obligations. So my argument is there is, there is a mismatch in risk profile. The burden for the protection of personal data under the GDPR still rests primarily with controllers, and they will want to address this contractually. To reflect this higher risk, controllers may wish to, we've said it already, increase liability caps. They could include broader indemnities to cover third-party claims, which may become more common given the rising risk of group action facilitated by Article 80. It may also be wise to carve in certain heads of loss to recoverable losses to the extent these are defined in your agreement, to include items such as incident response costs and cost of credit and fraud monitoring in the event of a breach. As Debbie has mentioned, the ICO also makes some good suggestions in its recent guidance around including a provision to the effect that nothing within the contract will relieve the processor of its own direct responsibilities and liabilities under the GDPR. And of course, in drafting data protection related liability clauses and indemnities, care should always be taken to ensure that they work together with any general liability clauses and that data protection related indemnities are carved out of any caps where agreed. And then, from the processor's perspective, and this is a biggie, I mean, that um, is, is an understatement. Um, the, the business imperative for the processor to manage risk across multiple customer relationships so that no one relationship could kill its business, to put it bluntly, is still there. And the GDPR isn't changing that. As lawyers, we've all been involved where someone is doing due diligence on one of our clients for a funding event or an exit and the more commercial contracts with very high liability caps or no liability caps at all, the more difficult those discussions can become. So nothing has changed there. It is a tricky time and Katie's absolutely right that with the higher fines and the imbalanced exposure for the controller, even though the processor themselves can now be fined around security and other measures, it, 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 this becomes a very difficult uh, discussion. I, I do think, though, that the focus for people who are trying to do the right thing and are being good corporate citizens, if I can use that phrase, the focus on fines is, I think, overstated. 
we, we do not expect, although of course it's too early for anyone to be sure, we do not expect that come May 2018 there will be a fiesta of fines coming out of European regulators. Fines, I think, will still be there for the people who show really serious contraventions of the rules. And so the instinct that if there's a cap, it needs to be at 4% of the controller's global turnover is, at least in my view, with my processor hat on, misconceived. I think what processors should do, though, is work out their playbook. Don't do this on the fly in a live negotiation trying to work out what your worst case is, what's the highest cap for different contract values you'll go to. Have that discussion internally up front and agree what the playbook is. Be really clear with the same sales teams in their messaging that that's one issue that's a real, a real line in the sand. And the other thing, and I think this goes for controllers and processors both, is try and refocus the discussion away from that very bleak worst case on, in, onto the ways that both parties can manage their risk and look like the good corporate citizens. So GDPR-driven governance, which actually is for both parties to look at and to work on, breach readiness, GDPR awareness throughout both organizations, training, breach prevention programs, all that good kind of stuff. If you look at what the GDPR says, when it does have some factors for the fining decisions, which are the duration of the, bru uh, of the infringement, the severity of the infringement, the number of people who were affected, the risk to data subjects, whether it was intentional or negligent, whether, the, whether that company on controller has been before the regulator, before all those kind of things will go into the mix. And I would rather dis the discussion move, move away from that and to... How can we look like, even if there does prove to be a problem, we did everything we could, we demonstrated compliance, we have the paper trail and the documentation that the GDPR drives, and try and take the discussion off in that, um, in that direction. So processors may run the argument that insisting on higher caps is misplaced as controllers may have the benefit of insurance, say. But this is not the whole answer for a number of reasons. Essentially, relying on insurance that the processor has in place for the benefit of its controller customer base is risky as the breach may affect more than one controller. Also bear in mind that insurance typically covers liability which the insured has at law. So if by virtue of a contractual indemnity, a processor accepts liability beyond that which would have applied at law, the insurance may not provide the necessary coverage. It may also be a term of the policy that the insured must take reasonable steps to limit exposure on this policy and query whether or not insisting upon a limitation of liability at some level would comply with this obligation. The controller could of course take out its own policy, but this is not free from difficulties. As we all know, the UK cyber insurance market is still in its infancy and as I understand it, whilst first party cover is available for many sizes of the company over in the UK, policies involving third party cover are typically seen in the US and still an area of growth over here. And the key question, as always, is what is actually covered? Does the policy protect an organization against security incidents, or does it extend to wider data protection regulatory breaches? There's likely to be a real public policy element to all of this. I would echo that. I mean, I think processors should look at GDPR insurance and make sure it covers more than, than cyber, cyber breach. When, when we've done that in this firm for platform clients, we typically find the, the cyber type cover they have already is really around breach and not around general regulatory compliance. So I, I would echo what Katie says. It's, an, it's a nascent market. Um, but certainly I think there's demand out there. The other thing to be aware of is it's, it's a gray area whether your fining exposure can be covered by insurance in any event. Um, certainly, it's not a criminal penalty. It's an administrative fine. It's very clear under English law that a criminal penalty cannot be covered by insurance because it meant, it's meant to be a disincentive to that behavior. And there is a concern, although it's not, it's a, it's not finalized and not clear from the case law, that a GDPR fine is not something that can be insured against either. And so you'll typically see a policy that'll say to the extent uh, you know, available un under law. 
One other flag, I would resist as a processor any obligation to add the controller as an insured or a beneficiary because actually getting insurance companies to do that is very, very difficult under the UK. And one final thought, I did read the other day that, it's, that apparently the position is different in Bermuda, which has quite an active insurance industry. So maybe it's possible to get uh, insurance cover out of, out of that market. So just to wrap up, um, I think we're all agreed that significant data security breaches are disastrous for everyone involved and very rarely will awarded damages or agreed compensation fully compensate for actual losses and crucially damage to good customer goodwill which is almost impossible to quantify. Controllers should be insisting on higher caps given their increased exposure and processes will ultimately need to be ready for this. However, as controller, you may not need an indemnity in all cases, and removing it could actually support your argument for a higher liability cap overall. Yeah, and then, and then just to wrap up from my perspective, oh, you need to limit your, lo your, your liability as a processor. I think that's clear. And I think I said it before, but I would increase the, fo the focus on the prevention of fines and the management of an infringement of the GDPR and, and, and not get isolated in that discussion around liability because it tends to be a really, really difficult one to, to resolve. I think it needs to be seen in the context of wider risk management. So I think that, that's, the, that's everything we were going to say, um, and we're out of time, so thank you for your questions. We'll be getting back to you separately on those, and um, we look forward to you joining us for our next webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye.